So it is my pleasure to host a primer on human cellular models today. And we're hoping to discuss, okay. So we're hoping to discuss how we can use specific cell types that are derived from human prepotent stem cells to study neurodevelopmental and psychiatric disorders. What we are really interested in understanding is how genetic variants that have been associated with these disorders, uh, how, how these variants translate into molecular changes in human cells, how they affect um, which cellular programs are specifically affected by these variants, and then how they shape the development, function, and connectivity of the human brain, and how in some individuals they might lead to disease. So really what we're trying to get at here is um, bridging this variant to function gap. And in, in order to bridge this gap, it is really important to study uh, human genetic backgrounds and human cell types. So if we consider the timeline of human brain development, as you can see here in the slide, we can see that uh, neurons are mostly generated in the prenatal period before birth. Similarly, cells of the immune system that are present in the brain are also generated in the prenatal period. However, glial cells such as astrocytes and oligodendrocytes are generated not only prenatally, but also during the first few years after birth. However, it is unfortunately or fortunately perhaps very hard to get tissue from the developing human brain. It is even harder to be able to manipulate cells from such tissues to be able to um, really um, identify which molecular changes are happening in these cells. This is why we turn to human prepotent stem cells, which can give us access to the human tissues and cell types of interest that are affected in disease. So it is now because of pre-programming technologies that have become really advanced, it is possible to obtain um, human prepotent stem cells from different people. So what we do is that from any cell type in the body, mostly blood nowadays, we can um, take these cells such as a blood sample and then reprogram the blood cells into human prepotent stem cells. Then in turn, these human prepotent stem cells can be differentiated into any cell type of interest. And in this case today, we're gonna be talking about brain cells, cell types that are present in the brain. And excitingly, there are many different approaches to generate very different cell types. And today we're gonna to focus on a subset of these that are relevant for the disorders we are interested in. And that very importantly, we can produce uh, via approaches that are very homogeneous, that are scalable and reproducible. And I cannot stress how important this is. There are also approaches to make other cell types such as interneurons, oligodendrocytes and other cell types. But these, um, most of these, produce um, cells like the heterogeneous cell types. And it will be very hard to work with if we, if we are interested in studying cells from many different people. I, also today, we will not be discussing organoid approaches or three-dimensional approaches where many cell types are often present in one organoid. And you have heard in the past and will probably hear more about this from Paula Arlotta and her colleague. So instead today, you will hear about these cell types that are here. From Matt Techmeyer and Greta Pintacura, um, you will hear about excitatory neurons. You'll hear then from Francesco Lemone about motor neurons. From Francesca Rapino, you will hear about astrocytes. And finally, from Martin Terrien, you will hear about microglia. And when we think or plan experiments to be able to study different cells from, the, from many different people, there are two main approaches that we can use. The first of these approaches is to examine cells from each donor separately in what we call an arrayed format. So this is the most traditional, most common approach. But more recently, because of work from Steve McCarroll and Kevin Egan's lab, we are also able to study mixtures of cells in uh, one dish in what we call the cell village approach. This approach is very valuable for many different ways. It, it really decreases the cost and the variance in many experiments and therefore enables us to scale up the number of individuals from which we can analyze cells at the same time. There will be some instances, some hypotheses for which it is better to use um, an array format uh, for an experiment. For example, if we're studying non-cell autonomous effects, but in others, the cell village approach can be very, very useful. We discussed a few times already how important it is to examine 
cells from many different human genetic backgrounds, uh, from healthy controls or from people with a certain diagnosis. And in order to enable this, we at the Stadia Center have established a big collaboration, international collaborations with many institutions in which we were able to obtain and reprogram induced prepotent stem cells from many different people. Actually, we have right now um, over 800 unique donors that are represented. So we take these um, prepotent stem cells, we expand them, QC them, and cryopreserve them. And very importantly, we also obtain um, the uh, sequencing data, such as whole genome sequencing, because this really empowers a lot of downstream experiments so that we can make sure that any experiments we design and analyze are really grounded in this in genetic information. So I'm really happy to be in this field at this time. It is exactly like a very exciting time to be um, studying, using these models to study these disorders. And as I hope you will appreciate from the talks that will follow is that now we are able to make many disease relevant cell types, specifically cell types relevant to neuropsychiatric disease. And we are able to um, make them from human genetic backgrounds that are relevant to these disorders that either carry or do not carry um, a, a combination of genetic variants of interest. Importantly, we are also able to make a lot of these cell types from many different people in a way that is reproducible. And we are also able to measure phenotypes from many different cell types, um, either at the same time or in an array format like we discussed. However, it is important to also keep in mind, and we can discuss this more and more in the end, we have saved some time for discussion. It is important to know that there are still some challenges to overcome in the field. We need to do a better job to understand how closely these in vitro cell types resemble the cell types in the human brain. And this is actually quite a challenge because gold standard data sets from uh, human in vivo um, cell types are, are very scarce. There are more and more transcriptional data sets from adult brain, but other cellular phenotypes are still scarce. And again, like we discussed, very limited data sets from the developing human brain. Another thing to keep in mind is that um, a specific cell type does not exist in isolation in the human body or in the human brain. So when designing our experiments, it will be a, to recapitulate a more physiological environment, it will be better to mix different cell types from different, from different um, generated by different ways to recapitulate a more physiological environment. For example, mixing um, excitatory neurons with inhibitory neurons with astrocytes, microglia, that is really the dream. And we're hoping that we can get there um, slowly but surely. And finally, and I cannot over overstress how important this last point is, it is important to increase the diversity uh, of the genetic background that we're studying. Right now, most genetic backgrounds that we have are from um, people of European or Caucasian ancestry, not only here at the Stanley Center, but really broadly in the US and Europe. And what this means is that in any functional studies that we conduct, the results from these studies might only be relevant to a minority of the, of the world population. So to the extent possible, it would be great to try in advance of designing our study to take a deep look at our cohort, make sure it's balanced um, as much as possible for ancestry, but also of course for sex. And I understand that this is a challenge because right now the number of cell lines from uh, non-Caucasian ancestries that are available is very limited, but again, there needs to be investment. And, and I think we're, we're starting to see this in reprogramming cell lines from people of, um, that are uh, from understudied populations. And with this, I would like to hand it over to Matt Techmeyer, who will tell you about excitatory neurons first. Great, thanks, Rolda. Um, so I am going to follow up on what Rolda talked about and give you an overview of the current approaches we are taking, utilizing um, iPSC-derived excitatory neurons for trying to investigate the genetics of these complex neuropsychiatric traits. And you know, our, our primary motivation for choosing this cell type within our group is really based off of the broader genetic studies of psychiatric conditions, which not only have implicated neuronal specific genes, but more so that many of these genes tend to converge on cellular programs, which specifically implicate excitatory neurons. And our methods for generating the cell type that we use were published from our group a few years ago whereby what we do is we integrate using lentivirus a marine neurogenin into our iPSCs, which then in the presence of doxycycline overexpresses neurogenin 2, 
and in combination with patterning molecules, pushes these towards an excitatory neuronal fate. And in our particular model, we pattern these cells such that they take on a fate, uh, we, we dorsal rostral pattern them, which takes on a fate that mimics something like the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is commonly implicated in these neuropsychiatric conditions. Now, our model also enables us not only to look at sort of more mature excitatory neurons um, in day, around day 28 and later on in, in more prolonged cultures, but in addition, and adapted by Mike Wells here at the Stanley Center, um, we're able to kind of capture these cells at day four in which mimics an early, early neural progenitor state. So it also enables us to look at sort of early developmental um, defects and phenotypes as well. And so I wanna to touch on some ways in which we're utilizing this model to help facilitate science here at the Stanley Center. So one of our first aims is to do large scale transcriptional profiling so that we can begin to understand the effects on gene expression of common and rare variants associated with these conditions and in response to certain pharmacological interventions. And so, so far over the last few years, we generated um, both bulk and single cell RNA sequencing data from more than 100 different genetic backgrounds um, uh, differentiated into both of these cell types. So we're now beginning to generate quite a large collection of data which can infer um, information about how certain variants mediate gene expression more globally. And sort of analogous to this, so what we've really aimed to do is leverage collaborations throughout the broad and expertise in other assay domains. And one particular is in partnership with Ann Carpenter and Shantanu Singh in the imaging platform to optimize a high content imaging assay known as cell painting, whereby it's a multiplexing dye assay. And so you, you stain multiple cell organelles and you sort of do a large feature extraction, kind of analogous to transcriptional profiling. And so we've been able to use this assay and optimize it for our, the cell types that we generate, be it neural progenitor cells and neurons and of an excitatory cell fate. And we can use this to extract cellular features and traits that are associated either with genetic variants or pharmacological Doug. conditions. And in doing so, this can really allow us to have another approach to nominating biological mechanisms associated with these diseases. And in, in addition, leveraging some very large data sets on small molecule targets in the imaging platform, it will enable us to sort of identify and perhaps map on small molecule targets in the context of psychiatric disease treatments. In addition, we've been building these reagents so that we can begin to have ask functional questions about variants which have been identified through both rare and common variant association studies, especially here at the Broad. And so our aim with using with leveraging CRISPR technologies and innovations such as CRISPR activation interference, we really want to begin to modulate the activity of some of these key genes which we've prioritized to understand their function within a cellular context and in a living context. And so here, you know, prioritizing some of these variants to then target using this system in all three of the cell types that we primarily work with to begin to understand when and where perturbations in these variants seem to cause significant biological disruption. Now, moving from sort of transcription and, and cell phenotype, one of the hallmark metrics for understanding neuronal health and function is to use electrophysiology and neurophysiology. And so in collaboration with Sami Farhi's group, in particular Vera Valak and Teresa Chen, they've been developing these all optical tools whereby you utilize channel rhodopsin proteins, which in the presence of blue light can trigger the activation of a neuron. And once activated, emit a red light that can be recorded using some state-of-the-art microscopes and cameras. And what this enables us to do is at large scale have high throughput neurophysiology readings from many neurons simultaneously. And further adaptations in this are going to enable us to look at synapse specific biology and potentially at some point interactions between cell types, both diseased and non-diseased to try to understand synaptic deficits between particular disease classes. And, and Rolda had mentioned, you know, different methodologies and approaches to utilizing cellular models. And one such innovation 
uh, led, spearheaded by Jana Mitchell and Jim Nemesh and Kevin Egan, Stephen McCarroll's group, was to develop a tool that would enable us to increase the scale of experimental biology, which desperately needs to keep pace with genetics. And so the, the approach that they innovated on was to generate these villages, whereby instead of culturing one cell line in one dish and then assaying it separately, you would culture many different individuals into a single dish. And of course, this helps us to reduce some of the technical variants associated with experiments and also the cost because now we can assay many individuals at once. Um, but it also has enabled us to uncover some previously unknown mechanisms and to sort of do large scale phenotyping. And so I just wanna provide an example from the paper that I would encourage you all to go and read. And, and the way this works is we, we culture many different individuals together and use some novel computational tools known as census sequencing to identify the representation and composition of how many people are in there. So ideally, if we put 10 people into a village, there are 10% 10, 10 representation for each individual. And in the context of what Jana did here, well, she took this village of individuals, and I think in this case, it was um, in the mid forties, and treated them with an antisense oligonucleotide, which targets splicing for a gene for, that encodes the SMN protein. And then what they ask in this system, or we do, is when we sort for a phenotype, and in this case, the protein expression of SMN, so you have a high protein expression fraction you, from flow cytometry, and a low protein expression, ex, expression fraction. And we, what we wanna ask is, based off of the initial representation, is there a shift based on which um, fraction you were sorted in? And so here's, a graph representing what we see in drug response. So SMN drug response is this shift in representation from low to high. And what you can see is that the shift in representation is dependent on the number of copies of SMN2 gene that an individual has. So the more copies of SMN2 they have, the more responsive they were to the treatment of this ASO, which makes sense because this ASO's target is the SMN2 gene. So it regulates splicing of that. So this is sort of being adapted to be utilized for broader assays um, beyond this. And um, this is just a great proof of principle to show that we're able to do kind of large scale phenogenomic studies using this pooled approach. So as a brief summary, um, the, the, the model we use in our lab, these iPSC derived excitatory neurons uh, have enabled us to explore brain function physiology in a disease specific and homogenous cell type. The methods that we use are scalable and they're also highly reproducible. Just within the Stanley Center and scientists here and some of you'll hear from today, hun oh, well over a few hundred of the cell lines that we have in our collection have been generated into this cell type and used in various different assays, including the ones I've talked about. The fact that these are scalable and reproducible and homogenous means that they're amenable to drug and perturbation screens. And as you'll hear from Greta next, these also enable high throughput biochemical studies. So the ability to generate billions of these cells overcomes significant limitations that we've had previously to following up some of the genetics with more biochemical and function-based studies, which, which Greta will allude to. And within our group and other members of the Stanley Center, there are ongoing evolutions in all of these methods that I've talked about um, today and would be happy to and encouraged by anybody who's interested in learning more about these to reach out to us. And I also wanna talk about a few of the limitations we're all to mention, and, and these aren't necessarily specific to, to the excitatory neurons, but I wanna talk about some of the limitations and how we specifically are trying to address these. So the initial one was limited complexity. We understand that these psychiatric conditions are whole brain and systems phenotypes and are not in, in any case, wholly burdened to one single cell type. So, you know, people here at the Stanley Center, there are a lot of group and others are generating these 3D brain organoids, which allow us to recapitulate not only some of the development of the human brain, but also the structure and complexity of the mature brain. And additionally, our group and others are trying to experimenting and advancing our co-culture systems, whereby we can begin to explore interactions between cell types with hypothesized mechanisms um, in these conditions. Secondly, the, the, like, like genetics, the, the lack of diversity in iPSCs um, is a severe issue and they always skew towards Northern European ancestry. So we specifically have begun collecting samples and consenting for samples in both Asia and Africa 
to try to not only generate more equity in the IPSC studies, but because we understand that these variants have a significant reliance on the genetic background. And we need to understand much more clearly the ancestry specific allele functions in, in these conditions. And as always, we, we want more and continual engagement between the geneticists so that we can further prioritize our gene selection on follow-up studies and hopefully you know, make more progress towards target discoveries in these cell types. Um, so with that, I think now we'll hear from Greta on, on her work. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction. The aspirational goal of any in vitro experimental model of a complex system is really that of deconstructing such system in a meaningful way. And obviously, inaccurate or misleading representation of reality is a risk for any reductionist in science, um, and especially true for modeling tissues, organs, or even entire organisms using cell models. So here in my talk, I will try and propose some standardized metrics that we can all use to assess how good of a proxy to reality excitatory neurons really are, at least from um, uh, a biochemical standpoint. Here at the Stanley Center, we are particularly focused on understanding the pathophysiology of uh, neurodevelopmental and neuropsychiatric disease. And therefore, uh, we want to think of cell systems really as toy models that can recapitulate certain measurable aspects of the human brain. And as in any multidimensional analysis, we also want to try and find the, so to speak, principal components of a complex disease by breaking it down into phenotypes that we, one can measure using different technologies such as electrophysiological assays, morphological analysis, transcriptomic, just to name a few. And a huge effort, oh, I'm sorry. A huge effort within the study center is also that of studying cell type specific interactomics as a systematic unbiased methodology to translate human genetics into biological discovery. And to briefly illustrate our thinking, I will use schizophrenia as a case study, but you can in principle substitute uh, schizophrenia with any other heritable polygenic disease. So what we do is to build protein-protein interaction networks of protein encoded by genes strongly associated with schizophrenia in cortical excitatory neurons derived from iPS cells to investigate how genetic variation converges onto functional pathways in schizophrenia. Our approach is very pragmatic and really depends on two premises. The first one being a strong genetic incrimination, meaning that we first selected a ranked set of genes strongly associated with schizophrenia, and B, a scalable cell model that in our case is excitatory neurons that we know from transcriptomic studies to be vulnerable to schizophrenia, as Matt has just reminded us, and that we can make a scale that is comp compatible with high quality biochemistry, thanks to Valdos modified and gene to protocol that was nicely described in the previous talks. After performing quantitative uh, mass spectrometry on immunoprecipitations of protein products of the genes of interest in human neurons, we build a protein-protein interaction network. And using bioinformatics, statistical and genetic tools, we then identify novel cell type specific interactions and highlight convergence of such interactions. We also quantify potential correlation between topological structures within the network and the enrichment of genetic signal. From there, we then set out to follow up on the biological significance of such findings with the ultimate goal of gaining mechanistic insights about schizophrenia to guide patient stratification, for instance, or uh, therapeutics, hopefully. But let's go back to the fundamentals, really. Uh, now the question is how well the biochemistry in cell models really represents biochemical interactions and interactions that occur in the human brain. And this question can really be spelled out in three separate ones. The first one being how well cell models recapitulate true 
biochemical interactions. In other words, how can we prove that with our cell models, we can refine what was already known from previous biochemical studies, but also how well cell models recapitulate real interaction, meaning interaction that specifically occur in a certain uh, tissue and not our gener generic artifactual ones that depend on the cell model itself. And third, um, perhaps the most important one, how such interaction can be used to better understand the model itself. So starting from the beginning, a way to answer the first question really is to quantify the overlap between original, our original interaction data sets and data sets deposited on protein-protein interaction databases. There are several public interaction databases that can be interrogated, the largest one of which is in web. And this is the one that I will reference to during this talk. And here you can see an immunoprecipitation of TDP43, a protein that is encoded by uh, the TARDP gene. And we know that mutations of TARDP have been associated with proteinopathies and uh, with a wide range of cell types and defects in neural, uh, neuronal transcription and regulation. Here you see a volcano plot representing an immunoprecipitation of TDP43 in human neurons quantitated against a negative control. And each green dot in the volcano plot here indicates a protein that was found to be specifically interacting with TDP43. And from the scatter plots uh, right uh, at, uh, on the right hand side, you can see that typically the reproducibility of the experiments is quite high, as well as the overlap with previously reported interactions that are here uh, marked in yellow on the volcano plot. Um, and on the one hand, this means that we can validate the reproducibility of the experiment. However, the overlap is not perfect, obviously, and the comparison per se does not justify the need for performing this experiment in neurons as opposed to relying purely on existing data. That's why we went on uh, and we performed a number of immunoprecipitations of proteins, either neuronally expressed or oncogenes in excitatory neurons and in a number of cancer cell lines. And after performing MSMS on all the immunoprecipitations that you see here represented by Watson blood, what we found was that uh, there were 870 unique interactors across all the immunoprecipitation, over 80% of which were novel. And among the novel ones that are broken down here in this Venn diagram, 40% are even unique to a single cell line. And again, this result uh, could simply represent high level of noise, but actually the validation rates are high and they are consistent across all the in individual uh, slices of the pie. Overall, this result that therefore suggests that although comparisons uh, with databases can be useful and are important, cell type specificity is key in discovering novel interactions. So it's still important to reproduce the interactions in your favorite cell model, in our case, in excitatory neurons. To answer the second question, we compared high immunoprecipitations in cells and cortex. How does a data set, the question really is, how does a data set derive from a single cell type compared to a complex tissue where multiple cell lines are represented to varying degree, but also is certainly closer to the brain uh, and uh, than a single, single cell type in culture? So the color code of the volcano plot that you see here, and that represents an immunoprecipitation of shang here, um, uh, is the same as the one that I showed you before. So in green are significantly enriched interacting protein of Shang-3 um, and uh, represents an immunoprecipitation that was performed in, in human cortex. However, this time in yellow are the interactors that we also found uh, in the same immunoprecipitation performed in induced neuron. If we put together the data from this immunoprecipitation and a number of other immunoprecipitation that are named here on the right hand side, what we found is that the overlap between um, the results obtained in neurons and in cortex is highly significant. 
although the overall number of detected proteins um, uh, in, in the human cortex, as well as the correlation between replicates of the cortical experiment are on average lower. And this is because cortex is a less abundant and homogeneous samples per definition, and it's obviously suboptimal for in vitro biochemistry, unlike cells that although still seem to represent quite well the tissue are at the same time also likely to lead to broader interactions, so perhaps to better drive discovery. And finally, we use genetics to try and make sense of the interactions that we generate. There are several bioinformatic tools, including one that we generated in-house called Genopy, that easily allow to connect and compare different data sets. For instance, it might be informative to know whether a certain interactome has a genetic burden of some sort. So it's useful to overlay and quantify the overlap, for instance, between your interactome and proteins encoded by genes mapped by GWAS-SNP, for instance, or significantly mutated genes identified through uh, exome sequencing, or also proteins that are intolerant to loss of function mutation using uh, NOMAD, the NOMAD database, or even to compare them to a custom data set uh, that is manually created. So let's look at an example uh, close to our interest, TCF4. And we all know that polymorphisms in TCF4 have been associated with multiple psychiatric disorders, including schizophrenia. And interestingly, the interactome of TCF4 is enriched for common schizophrenia variants. And curiously, the top significant schema uh, gene that is set D1A is also present uh, among the interactors. And although obviously there is no significant overlap between schema and uh, TCF4 interactome, this finding per se can perhaps inspire the design of targeted downstream experiment. So if we do this exercise systematically, for instance, immunoprecipitating proteins encoded by the top ranking schizophrenia associated genes, we can build an interaction network. And again, the metrics that I'm showing here reflect what I've previously told you. So most interactions are novel over uh, almost 4% were already uh, reported by in web, but over 96% are new. Um, but there are also other metrics of interest. For instance, we find convergence on common interactors. In fact, as you can see here in this second uh, pie chart, Venn diagram, my pie chart here, is that index protein share um, more than 40% of index protein, protein share at least one common interactor, interactor. Additionally, we find an enrichment for schizophrenia genetic signal in the network compared not just to the genomic background, uh, but specifically to the neuronal proteome, as you can see here. So please focus on the first row of this complex schema that also reports enrichment results for subnetworks within the larger schizophrenia interactome network. Um, and what you can see is that genetic signal is highly significant in the combined network, and it's also specific to schizophrenia and not uh, present for other psychiatric disorders. We also looked uh, into a recent study which sequenced postmortem cortex of schizophrenia patients and control by single cell RNA seq and annotated cell types whose expression profile represents differentially expressed genes in schizophrenia patients versus control. And when we performed uh, enrichment analysis that compared the natural genes against older genes expressed in neuronal proteome, in both cases we found the natural to be enriched for fertile cortex proteins encoded by genes that are differentially expressed in a number of excitatory neurons uh, located in different layers of the cortex, and with the most significant being layer five and six neurons. Um, and with, um, which is not just a remarkable finding per se, but circles back to the original choice of excitatory cortical neurons for this kind of study and identifies uh, runner up for perhaps uh, downstream repetition of the same biochemical analysis. For instance, it would be interesting to look into interneurons. Inter That's uh, definitely an option. 
So to summarize what I've just told you, we have vast evidence that cell models recapitulate true interaction as proved by strong correlation between uh, novel inter interactions and previously reported ones, real in interactions through the correlation between cell-based interactions and matching tissue-based ones. And I also briefly shown you um, that how interactions can be looked at through the lenses of statistics and genetics. And specifically, I've shown you a case study where a schizophrenia center protein interaction network was found to be enriched for schizophrenia signal and proteins differentially expressed in excitatory neurons of schizophrenia patients. And with this, I hand over to Francesco Limone that is going to talk to you about his experience with motor neurons. Francesca. Thank you, Greta. And so, hello everyone. My name is Francesco Limone. I'm a PhD student in Ken Megan's lab, and I'm going to um, talk to you about a project I've been carrying out, and hopefully, um, it's which is stemming from a lot of the points that my colleagues have brought up about the importance of. Um, specifically looking at um, specific subtypes of neurons, but also about the robustness of this uh, system of our expression of neurogenin to, uh, to produce neuronal subtypes from um, uh, dozens and dozens, and hopefully even more uh, pluripotent stem cell lines. And so um, I wonder if we could adapt this overexpression system to uh, robustly uh, differentiate other kinds of neurons in the lab you know, uh, because of my project in the lab was uh, focusing also on motor neuron diseases, we wonder if we could couple this uh, engine to overexpression with um, developmental patterning that would uh, produce motor neuron cells. But I'm going to quickly uh, talk to you guys about what is a motor neuron. So uh, motor neurons are specialized cells that reside in the motor cortex, the brainstem, and the spinal cord. Altogether, this system forms a motor circuit that allows us to move, walk, and breathe, and carry out basic functions. And specifically, uh, lower motor neurons that reside in the spinal cord, a very specific type of neuron that um, can contact muscles directly through a very specialized synapse, uh, which is called a neuromuscular junction. So this is a pretty specific kind of neuron that allows us to move and to translate what uh, our brain is thinking into uh, in contact with the outside world. Um, and we're specifically interested in this kind of um, lower spinal motor neurons because they're affected by several neurodegenerative diseases, specifically what we're interested in, which is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS. And so um, what we were hoping to do is something that um, Matt and Greta have described briefly, briefly before is that overexpression of NGN2 coupled with wind inhibition is able to uh, frontalize and dorsalize the cells to produce um, neurons that would resemble cortometric neurons of the cortex. And so we wonder if we could um, uh, couple this system with posteriorizing and ventralizing factors that would be able to, uh, would allow us to generate a motor neuron, spinal motor neuron-like cell. And so the idea was to um, use this simple developmental strategy in which uh, we would compare the expression of the overexpression of NGN2 alone in the similar system that Mike, that Matt has uh, described before, which is the original uh, pseudo protocol, or um, the overexpression of NGN2 coupled with uh, a few neuralizing factors, and then either the um, overexpression of NGN2 with this dorsorostral patterning that would generate a cortical motor neuron and a uh, cortical neuron, and then. Um, investigate whether uh, coupling NGN2 over expression with this ventrocaudal patterning would help, would allow us to generate a modern neuron-like cell. So what we did is to look very early into the differentiation and see if master regulator of uh, central nervous system development would be um, expressed according to our patterning strategy. And so I'm just showing you a few of them here um, that we tested by um, RTQPCR. So as you can see, uh, many of the master regulator of cortical development are actually upregulated um, after expression in GN2 coupled with wind inhibition. So through this cort cortical-like um, patterning molecules. And then as you can see in some cases, even this uh, um, the spinal cord patterning can even induce an inhibition of certain 
of the expression of certain um, cortical must regulator of development. And then on the other hand, you, you can see how um, patterning towards a spinal cord state is, can actually upregulate some Hox genes that are regulators of posterior um, structures of uh, um, central nervous system, but also of some of the uh, mass regulators of um, ventral spinal cord development and motor neuron development. And I'm going to focus specifically on MNX1, uh, also known as HP9. So this is a um, really a master regulator of spinal motor neuron development, and it's only expressed in the central nervous system in neurons that are in the ventral spinal cord and then will become motor neurons. And so as you can see here, we were lucky enough to um, have in hand a reporter, pre-reported stem cell line that uh, expresses GFP under the control of the HP9 promoter. And as you can see here, um, by day seven, so by the day that uh, the cells start to resemble the neurons, 95% of uh, cells that were exposed to the spinal cord patterning express GFP and therefore uh, are motor neuron-like cells. And so we wondered if this um, patterning and neuronal fate would be maintained throughout the differentiation. And so we looked at later time point throughout the um, differentiation. So by day 30, the cells not only express um, markers of mature motor neurons and solve the cholinergic machinery that would allow them to contact the muscle, but even some um, markers of uh, motor neuron subtype that are actually um, able to innervate the limb and allow us to move. And so we're very happy to see that not only we could direct um, NGN2 um, neuralizing abilities to different neuronal fate, but that also this fate are maintained throughout, uh, throughout the differentiation. And uh, we tested it with a few cell lines because we wanted to make sure that obviously the system was robust enough and it seems like it is, uh, but we uh, wanted to go a step forward and really look at um, a more unbiased uh, system to see that uh, if uh, this protocol would be amenable to uh, differentiation of many, many cell lines. And so this is why we decided to um, implement a technique that has been devised in collaboration within the Agon lab and the uh, McCarroll group and what um, Stanley and uh, so this is something that's and both Ralda and Matt have described before but I'm gonna go through it very quickly so what we did uh, is to um, use around 50 uh, pluripotent stem cell line these are just controls many different backgrounds and um, in fact even the NGN2 uh, uh, inducible system that we've been describing now differentiate them into uh, this lower induced motor neuron like cells. And then once the cells are post mitotic, so between day six and eight, cells were all pulled together in a village culture, as um, has been described before. And this allowed us to grow them all together, reduce variability, and also cost of culturing so many cell lines together. So this could put them all in one dish. And then we carried out single cell RNA sequencing analysis. Um, uh, for transcriptomic studies. And so I'm just showing you here a uh, TSNE projection of um, this analysis of the 50 uh, cell lines that we uh, differentiated. We could, were able to detect 47 of them at the end of the differentiation. So to us, was big success that not many dropped out of this. And that, as you can see here, donors seem to distribute pretty evenly throughout the whole, um, throughout the graph, which led us to think that it was a pretty robust system that wouldn't be somehow skewed because of uh, the origin of the cell. And then we really wanted to exploit the, um, the amount of data that we can get from the single cell resolution. And so one interesting thing about motor neurons is that because the spinal cord is so big, there's really, really different subtypes of cells that um, can be identified throughout the spinal cord and that innervate different groups of muscles and allow us to you know, move our um, face and tongue and like breathe or move our uh, limb. And so we wonder if we could identify any of these cell types into uh, in our uh, data set. And I'm just showing up briefly here that we, we could, we could identify four subtypes, four known subtypes of um, spinal cord motor neurons. And then these are consistent with the kind of patterning that we are um, uh, subjecting the cells to. And then very interestingly, all 47 of the donors that we could detect could actually generate 
each of the four groups and then to a similar extent to really and that this really uh, made us think that this protocol not only is very robust, but it's pretty reproducible for, uh, for like dozens and dozens of cell lines. And so I mentioned very quickly before that modern neurons are kind of sort of a special neuron because they uh, form this synapse, so this contact with the muscle that allow us to move. So we wonder if we could establish an in vitro system to prove that the cells can actually contact muscles and um, form a neuromuscular junction like structure. So we uh, designed this co-culture system in microfluidic devices in which we can culture neuron mixed with um, astrocytes derived from mice uh, to allow uh, further maturation of the cells in one side of this microfluidic device. And then we derived um, muscle progenitor cells uh, from mouse and culture them on the other side of the device. And the two um, chambers are connected by small grooves that only allow axons to go through. So this is what a device looks like. So on one side, you can see that we have neurons co-cultures with the astrocytes, and then only axons can go through the small grooves and contact muscles on the other side. And so I'm just going to zoom in here to show you guys that um, after only 10 days in culture, in co-culture system, these cells start to um, not only grow on the other side and contact muscles, but also form structures that really resemble um, and are reminiscent of uh, neuro, the neuromuscular junction uh, that we can see um, in vivo. And so hopefully, today I very quickly uh, showed you guys uh, that our protocol can generate a pure population of modern neuron-like cells, um, advancing our system in a way compared to other protocols since we, can, uh, we don't have any progenitor cells left, and there is no need for cell sorting or immunopanning to isolate the real uh, modern neurons out of a mixed culture. The system seems to be uh, very robust and highly reproducible, and because of these two things put together, really making it available, amenable for high-scale production of the cells in high throughput assays, which is, uh, sort of brings uh, the field a little forward uh, compared to other protocols before. And then, as a lot of my colleagues have mentioned, we still need to do a lot of work to really uh, see how, what's the resemblance of the cells, the resemblance that, of the cells that we use with their in vivo counterpart. Obviously, as Harald well, just mentioned, it's very hard to get uh, data from uh, human cells uh, in, in the actual central nervous system. And so some of the um, schematages that we're really using is to co-culture our neurons with astrocytes and glial cells that for now we're doing with mouse, but as um, Francesca and Martina are going to show you now, we are also trying to devise uh, some uh, protocols that would allow us to generate this kind of cells uh, from human pluripotent stem cells and so to build on the complexity of our systems. So I think I'm going to um, pass it on to Francesca so that she can talk to us more about it. All right. Thank you, Francesco. So my name is uh, Francesca Rapino, and I'm a postdoc in the Rubin lab. So we heard about uh, excitatory neurons and motor neurons, but I would like to focus your attention now on another cell type that populate the brain that is called astrocyte. Astrocyte from the ancient Greek literally means star-shaped cells, and this very obvious why has been named like this from this very beautiful uh, immunofluorescence. So at the very beginning, when the uh, cells were discovered, they were thought to be just uh, glue. So they were also called glia at the time. So glia, general term for astrocyte, microglia, and oligodendrocyte. And at the very beginning uh, of their discovery, discovery, they were thought that were these cells had the only fun function to support neural uh, growth, and um, and they were an homogeneous population of cells. Thanks to the study done by many groups now, we know that indeed this, uh, um, this is not completely correct because astrocytes are a very heterogeneous population of cells and they play a critical role in brain function and maintenance. So among the role, uh, as I mentioned, there is not only neural support or survival, but astrocytes are involved in the BBB formation and maintenance. They're involved in neurotransmission as well as metabolic regulation. And importantly, they're involved in synaptogenesis uh, uh, pruning and brain plasticity, and all these functions help to generate um, 
a functional uh, network and wiring and proper function of the brain. So due to their many roles, it's, uh, it's pretty obvious that any dysfunction in the astrocyte can contribute to uh, neurodegeneration, CNS disease. So astrocytes have been implicated both in neurodegenerative disease, such as Alzheimer, Huntington, Parkinson, or weird ALS, for example, but they're also implicated in neuropsychiatric disorders and uh, edema, autoimmune uh, auto inflammatory disease. And more and more is evident how these astrocytes are playing a role and contributed to the disease. So our lab is interested in studying neurodegenerative disease and neuropsychiatric disease. They're typical uh, human disease. So we wanna study that in human cells. As Radla mentioned at the very beginning, unfortunately, uh, uh, the source for primary samples is very limited. Um, so we don't have uh, accessibility to those samples. They're pretty much variable. And most, on the most part, they are unknown genetic because they are biopsy or, or, or samples uh, taken from uh, uh, fetal uh, or, uh, yeah. So one exceptional tool we have is, uh, uh, stem cells have they been described. So those have the capacity to differentiate in any cell type. And in the brain, uh, especially worried about neurons. And now I'm going to show you about astrocyte. So these provide an unlimited source of cells. We can generate homogeneous population if we need to. And most importantly, we can work with a non-genetic uh, background and we can edit those cells to study a particular gene or correct a particular gene to study its invol involvement in disease. So said that um, at the time we start our project, there were few protocols available for the differentiation of astrocyte, and every protocol you can, as you can imagine, has their advantage and disadvantages. So if you're interested in this, I recommend reading those two reviews that talk about IPS differentiation from astrocyte. But for the purpose of this talk, I just want to mention there are a few methods. Some of them are a complete monolayer methods, so meaning the IPS are differentiated into a progenitors and then into astrocytes. Often those methods require long time of culture and require purification of a neural precursor or oligodendrocytes, so precursor cells through fax, immunopanning, uh, or different other methods. Then we have the 3D methods that are either brain organoids or cortical spheroids. Although those methods can produce the most mature cells as far as we can tell, the problem is the long time of culture of those cells. And plus they also require a sorting of astrocyte if we want to study and have an homogeneous population of cells. And then there are hybrid methods. There are 2D and 3D, combination of 2D culture and 3D culture in which, uh, again, you go through a stage of neural uh, progenitors and then you differentiate astrocytes. So as I mentioned, when we start this uh, project, we were uh, interested in producing large amount of cells. Uh, oh, sorry, before going to that, I want to show the setting for people that haven't seen that. So we use... Uh, Okay, sorry, we use, uh, at the time we start this protocol, uh, this project, we were interested in producing large amount of cells to perform uh, a screening, and I will tell you why in a minute. But so we decided to adopt one of the existing protocol for the differentiation in 3D of astrocyte. So what we do is we start with IPS cells, AES cells, and we adapt them in 3D culture using a spinel frask and bioreactor. I'm going to show you in the next slide the setting. So these uh, pluripotent spheres that look uh, pretty homogeneous. They're, they can be patterned using a combination of different media, uh, um, patterning molecules and cytokines into uh, the astrocyte fate. And after 30 days, we can dissociate those cells, plate them in culture, and as you can see, they resemble uh, uh, star, uh, astrocyte like cells. So, just for one people that are not familiar with this, I want to show the setting of the bioreactor and spinner flask. So this is inside our incubator. We have this platform that contain a magnetic uh, steer and uh, these are called uh, spinner flask and contain a magnet here. Hopefully you can see the, the sphere spinning. So this will allow the um, oxygenation of the media for long-term character, as well as uh, the shearing force well forming the spheres when we put in uh, uh, pluripotent stem cells. 
Okay, so um, when we um, came up with this protocol, we wanted to characterize a little bit the cells. And for us, it was very important to get an homogeneous population of cells for screening purpose. So what I'm showing you here is the, uh, the quantification of uh, the expression of CD44, that is an astrocytic marker compared to CD200, that is a neural marker. In uh, astrocyte derived from both IPS cells or ES cells compared to primary fetal uh, astrocyte. And I guess you can appreciate that over 80% of the cells, when we dissociate them, they are CD44 positive. So meaning that 80% of the cells we have in the sphere are astrocyte. Once we plate them in, in two dimension, um, uh, all virtually all of them express CD44, but they also express other canonical marker of astrocytes, such as LDH1, L1, S100 beta. Uh, some of the cells express GFIP, they express aquaporine marker, the gap junction CX43, and the glutamate transporter. So for uh, to conduct our screening, it was important to assess that those astrocytes produced from stem cells were immunocompetent. So why I mean so by immunocompetent, I mean astrocyte can secrete cytokines and chemokines, and we assess that our IPS derived cells compared to primary fetal astrocyte could secrete the same um, type of cytokine, and this was uh, what was reported in literature. And most importantly, we wanted to see if our astrocyte were able to express a particular protein called complement component four. We were interested in the uh, complement component four because it has been recently associated with the high risk of schizophrenia. So we, by, um, by ELISA, we could detect the, that astrocyte will, uh, are able to secrete C4 protein, but also we were able to uh, modulate this signal by using an unspecific blocker of secretion called monensins. And we saw that pro-inflammatory stimuli such as interferon gamma will enhance uh, this um, secretion. These two were actually used as, po as positive and negative control in our screening. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, we were interested in screening for compound that were able to modulate the secretion of C4 in astrocyte. So we have performed a small molecule screening. Uh, our readout was uh, the ELISA because we used supernatan as well as nuclei number uh, to look for um, toxic compound. And after uh, looking into our, our eats to make a very um, long story short, what we found we could we were able to identify both pathway as well as uh, specific uh, targets that are able to modulate C4 in astrocyte. And if you are interested in this story, we'll give a talk next week at the Stanley Center uh, and we'll tell you more uh, about this project. But just to conclude, I, I just want to compare uh, briefly our astrocyte, uh, stem cell derived astrocyte protocol with the others. And I want to mention that our protocol uh, is able to produce astrocyte in just 30 days, starting from the day you have pluripotent uh, um, spheres. So, um, and then uh, it's a one step protocol, so it doesn't need uh, any dissociation of, uh, until the very end. Uh, it doesn't need any purification step, and it's very scalable, scalable because we, what I showed you is a 150 ml flask, spinner flask, but we can scale that up using 500 ml. We can produce billions of neurons, uh, billions of astrocytes. Sorry. And then I will, I will like, just would like to mention that uh, we we use this protocol to, to differentiate multiple lines from LTO patient uh, derived cells. And this has been performed in the lab by me, other people, and by other labs uh, since we shared this protocol. One of the disadvantages, uh, I will call disadvantage of this protocol is require specific equipment, as I showed you into a bioreactor spinner flask for uh, producing astrocyte in this way. And we are, as other already mentioned, we are not yet sure about the maturation stage compared to the human uh, astrocyte counterpart. Um, so, and this is a general problem in the field. Say so with this, uh, I'm done for now and I'm happy to answer question at the end. Um, and now I'll, I'll pass it to Martin. Thank you, Francesca. Oh. Okay. So, okay. 
everyone. Uh, so my name is Martine and I'm a postdoc in Beth Stevens lab. And our, um, our favorite uh, cells to study uh, from IPS are our microglia. And my uh, project, well, my project focuses mainly on Alzheimer's disease uh, in our lab. As many of you know, we're focusing on microglia biology from really development and, and, and all the way to aging in the context of neurodegenerative disease, but also in the context of psychiatric diseases. And today I'll give you a, a few examples of what we can do with those IPS derived microglia. Uh, I think it's, uh, I, I think I wanna say after you've seen the, the nice talk from Aralda and Kevin's group, as well as uh, Francesca's astrocytes, like that it is pretty early days for IPSC derived microglia. So uh, unfortunately, as much as we're expanding we haven't tested hundreds of cell lines so far, but we're really hoping to, to get there in, in the next in the near future. So, so microglia are the immune cells of the brain. They make up 7 to 10 percent uh, of the brain cells, and they're really important to maintain brain homeostasis. And how they do that is that they're constantly surveilling the brain, looking for toxic proteins or um, looking for toxic proteins or apoptotic cells to engulf and releasing at the same time growth factors or any uh, neuroprotective uh, proteins. Uh, however, while all those functions are really essential during um, for to maintain brain functions, they can also become uh, detrimental in disease context. So it was really important with us to find a way in a dish to model some of these key microglia function that could be, uh, that were very sensitive so that we could see, uh, see the shift between beneficial and detrimental diseases. And this is what I'll be uh, focusing on today. So there's been a few uh, differentiation protocols that have been published so far, and they've been very nicely reviewed in this uh, paper that was published a few months ago uh, that I really so strongly suggest you to, to read if you're interested in this. And uh, the one that we have uh, chosen is a protocol that was published by uh, Matt Burton jones at UC Irvine in 2017. And we chose it because it is um, it yields to a very high purity of cells. So uh, most of the cells at the end of the differentiation, and this is like more than 95% of the cells at the end are really expressing some key microglia markers that are, are really essential. And uh, so it's a very homogeneous population at the end, making it very easy to do assays at the end of the 40 days. So it is a 40 day differentiation protocol where we go, we start from IPSC, and we go through like an hematopoiesis stage, microglial differentiation and maturation stages. And, and we've done this differentiation protocol right now with over 12 uh, cell lines, and it just seems to be a very robust protocol in our hands. And at the end of the 40 days, uh, you can see some of the nice pictures here that were actually taken by uh, Francesco showing that uh, most of these cells were expressing those key, um, key microglia markers. And some of the key questions we're really interested to study with those IMGL is really looking at the uh, what is the effect of genetics. So we know that many of diseases, genetics it is our there's uh, genetic mutations that are found in genes that are highly expressed in microglia. We also wanted to know what is the effect of brain environment on microglial function, knowing that they're constantly surveilling the brain, um, the, the signal they're getting from the environment is essential. And, and finally, something we re were really interested in model as well is what is the impact of age or of time, so during development or during aging. And to try to assess some of these questions, we have developed uh, different models at the moment where we are looking at microglial function, going from a pure monoculture, um, pure monoculture um, differentiations, all the way to a chimeric model where we can inject the cells in, in a mouse brain. And I'll give example of all these different models in the next few slides. And, uh, and I'm sure as you can imagine, all these models have their advantages and disadvantages. So while monoculture can be uh, very useful to look to do a high throughput screen or where we want to like to challenge the cells and really have a regulated environment on the cells, it, there is in monoculture, like the cells are clearly lacking input from, uh, from the rest of the, the brain cells. So, uh, so, and so that's that's why we've turned towards slice culture or chimeric models where we have this input from the brain environment. Uh, however, those models are, are a little longer to develop and they're less uh, high throughput. So, so, uh, so, so that's how we've been thinking about these different models, depending on the questions that we're trying to ask, say, to ask and going back and forth between these different models. 
So I'll start by talking about the, the, the monoculture, which is uh, the, um, the model we've been using most. And, and as I said, those, co those uh, culture, there's uh, only microglia in the dish. So to have to bring a little bit of the brain environment to the dish, what we're doing is that we're treating the cells with different brain challenges. So different um, stimulus that they would see in the brain that we think is uh, important for their function and that can elicit a pathological like function. So in this case, we've been, uh, you, we can treat with like apoptotic neurons, pathological proteins, myelin or synaptic debris. And this is very useful because uh, we can really control what we're putting on the cells and looking at and look at their uh, function after the cells have been treated. So either looking at morphology, motility, or, or some um, or doing some media assay to look at what they're secreting. So, uh, so, so one of the very important assets that we're doing, and I think this is one of the uh, great advantage of monoculture, is that we can do a lot of live imaging very easily. So we know that microglia in the brain, and those pictures are from in vivo microglia, the microglia in the brain have a very nice ramified structure, like the picture you can see on, on the left. However, when they become in a disease state or when they get activated, they change their structure drastically and become amoeboid. And they, so, so there's a drastic change in morphology that, uh, that we can actually uh, very easily identify. And while our, our cells in, vivo, in vitro are, are, do not have the, the same extent of processes as they do in the brain, we can see major changes in their morphology when they're, when they're moving or, or when they're uh, submitted to different challenges, as you can see in this video. And this really allows us to do, while doing live confocal imaging, we can look into like the morphology of the cells, the length of their processes. We can look at the speed at which they're moving. So as you can, if you can see on the video, some cells are moving much faster than others. And one of the key assay we have also developed is to look at engulfment. So knowing how in the brain, one of the key functions of microglia is to phagocytose debris. Uh, we, we've put a lot of time to develop and adapt a very reliable engulfment assay. And it, with this assay, and this is what you're seeing also in the video. So uh, this assay is we're tagging uh, the substrate that we want the cells to engulf with a dye that is called pH roto. And this is the orange signal that you're seeing in the video. And basically this signal is only um, becoming fluorescent when the cells engulf the substrate. So we know for sure that the substrate is, is in the cells and not just sticking on its membrane. And we can monitor the signal either, either by doing live confocal imaging or by flow cytometry. We have tested this assay in multiple conditions by blocking phagocytosis either uh, pharmacologically with cytochalazin D or uh, blocking cell surface receptor. We've also tested it in the context of a genetic depletion of a receptor. So TREM2 is an essential receptor for phagocytosis. And when we delete it, we can see uh, that it, it decreases uh, phagocytosis drastically. So we've been putting, so, so I think this assay is very valuable to us and represent a really key function of microglia and having them in, in a dish will really allow us to do uh, larger perturbation screens with this model. Another very important advantage of being in a dish is that we can control what the cells are secreting. So usually in the brain environment, it's really difficult to understand when the cells are, are secreting some cytokine or protein and, uh, and exactly what they are. So in a dish, we can really uh, fully uh, understand what's happening by just taking media after the cells have been challenged. And this is what you're seeing here. So we've been looking at cytokine secretion or at viability using different Luminex assay. And we we can see here that the cells are, as expected, inducing a lot of expression of those cytokines when they're treated with LPS. However, so, so those were the main advantages of doing monoculture. But, but as I mentioned a few times already, this is really just a, a monoculture. These cells really need to, to feel their environment to be in their full, uh, to reach their full potential. So uh, we also, we're also working towards the development of, of a co-culture assay. So these images and video were taken by the Egan lab, but uh, at the moment, Nader, a new postdoc in her lab is actively working to develop uh, more elaborate and uh, work on this co-culture model. And, and what you can see in, in purple here is that the microglia is in green and it's really nicely almost embracing the neurons. And I think this will really allow to us to start looking at neuroimmune interactions 
while staying in control of their environment. So we can easily imagine that we can then challenge them with toxic proteins or other challenges that we want to put on these co-culture and look at the uh, viability, survival, and just the functional, functional changes of microglia in the context of, of neurons as well with this co-culture. To go into a little bit more uh, brain relevant and brain environment, we've been, uh, Mike and Dara in the lab, have been working on the development of a slice culture model. So this slice culture model is, I think, has the great advantage of being very versatile because we can basically, so what they're doing is they're just adding uh, microglia, so the IMGLs on top of the slice culture. And we can, as you can see in the picture here, the microglia very nicely integrates into the slice after after eight days, and they really start having this a more ramified structure that we that that we would expect to see from the brain. And this is a very versatile model that uh, they've been testing in a wild type context, but we can easily imagine to start testing in different mouse models to see how microglia are reacting, or in uh, or upon different uh, stimulation or, or challenges, doing like uh, injuries or demyelination injuries. So, so this is also one of the uh, avenue that we're working on. And uh, finally, uh, it's uh, probably the latest uh, model that I'm hoping to develop within the next few months uh, at Broad, and it is the chimeric model, where we can inject those microglia in P1 mouse models, and we see that they very nicely integrate the brain and populate the brain. And in this model, they, they do develop a much more ramified uh, morphology, and, and I think it is really what we will uh, need to get to the part, to, to the question of how does aging affect microglia? That is because uh, aging, uh, recapitulating aging in a dish has been a main challenge in the field. But I think with this model, we'll be able to see and validate some of the um, some of the data that we have in um, in the chimeric model, so in the brain, and see how microglia behave in the context of aging. So all of these have been uh, are, are, are great models, but I think as many as uh, observed so far, there are some limitation with these um, with these IMGLs. One of them that have been discussed so far is really that most of our knowledge is based on mouse data. So uh, I think this is something that Francesco and, and Ralda also talked of previously, is that it's really difficult to know that if what we are observing in a dish is specific to human or if it's a, um, a, an artifact of being in vitro. And in the context of microglia, that they represent such a small fraction of the total cells uh, in the brain, uh, comparing it to a uh, single cell data it is even more uh, difficult or challenging. But we're very uh, fortunate that uh, at Stanley Center, uh, Ivan McCaskill's lab, with the help of Tushar and, and Mike, have generated a very nice uh, microglia single cell data set. And we're actively working with them right now to compare if what we see in a dish resemble what they see from their freshly isolated human microglia. And I think that would be a great, um, uh, a gr that will really increase our understanding of microglia biology. And another limitation that is very specific actually for, for microglia is that they're very resistant to, to viral infection. So it's, make, it's making it very difficult to do a CRISPR screen uh, like, it, that, like we can do for, for neurons because those cells are, are just not uh, uptaking the, um, any, part, any viral particles. But, but as you know, again, like we're, we're very well equipped at Stanley Center to try to tackle this kind of question. And Sasha, a postdoc in our lab, as well as and Ben Zimmerman's lab is actively working to develop new technologies, either lentiviruses or AAV, to, to infect microglia. And, and I think that, that would be really a, a game-changing um, tool for the field. So, uh, so I'm reaching the end of the, my presentation. This is our IMGL team at, at the Stanley Center. Uh, if uh, anyone has additional questions, you can ask them uh, during this presentation or talk to, uh, to any of us. We're usually all very happy and enthusiastic to talk about my, uh, microglia. And uh, this is the acknowledgement slides for all the different projects. Uh, I, I think as you can see here, all of these projects are, are tremendously uh, teamwork. Like these cells take a lot of time to develop and we really uh, acknowledge and uh, are very grateful the help we're getting from, from our different uh, coworkers and lab members. We also would like to thank the all donors and their families because uh, it's really because of them that we can expand and have so many cell lines to test. 
I think also we would like to acknowledge the, the support that we get from the Stanley Center leadership, and particularly the also the uh, help we're getting from Elvira and Eladi. I think I, I'll speak for myself, but I think everyone would agree that IPSC are pretty challenging to study. And I think with Eladi and Elvira constantly helping us and keeping those a perfect condition for cell culture, it would not be possible. So I think now we'll be able to take all of your questions. Yeah, thank you, Martin, and, and everybody who's presented. Um, it's really, we're, we're very happy to have um, a, Stanley, a stem cell community at the Stanley Center right now. And like Martin said, we wouldn't be able to do the work we do without really the support of um, kind of program, program and project managers and um, GAs and um, Elvira and Ladi, and of course, Stanley leadership. So thank you all. And we're happy to have a discussion now, um, brainstorm together about ideas, um, next important steps for the field. Um, anything you guys would like to chat about? Well, if you have questions, please feel free to either unmute yourself, you've used the raise hand feature or um, put uh, questions in the chat. Steve, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so um, there, there has been this general problem of maturation. And uh, in fact, that's why studying aging seems is likely to depend on xenotransplantation. What kind of progress is being made in, in, in terms of uh, matura maturational stages of cells in vitro? Uh, and yeah. it, we can set aside organoids because you no, that's a, it's a, absolutely a very important question. I think there are two aspects to consider here. First is that the cells are outside of the normal physiological environment. So having, let's say, if we're looking specifically at excitatory neuron, and this is the same could be really argued for any cell type, then when they're, they're not alone in the brain. So in the brain, they need other cell types, the support of other cells, the interaction with other cells to push them towards maturity. So the if we want to um, be able to manipulate the cells in a two-dimensional format, which is amenable for high throughput screening, for example, high throughput imaging, I think the important step to do would be to add other cell types, such as interneurons, such as uh, astrocytes that are, right now we rely on rodent astrocytes, using uh, human astrocytes with relevant human genotypes and being able to examine these interactions is very important. Adding microglia, ideally we would add, if we wanna look at excitatory neuron maturation, we would add all of these. And again, the um, inhibitory or interneuron protocols are, are not there yet, but mm -hmm. there might be ways to get around that that we're exploring. Um, so I think that's going to be important. Another approach would be like uh, what Martin has presented to introduce these human cells in, in the in vivo environment, for example, in the mouse or in slice cultures, which also could help. And I when, once we understand, let's say, which um, let's say in an in vitro setting, which important factors from these other cell types are required for maturity. Of course, the ultimate goal would be to be able to make them, to make the excitatory neurons be able to mature on their own, yeah. own by complementing these to the dish. but we're not there yet. Yeah, no, no. and you mentioned, uh, of course, and we, we well know that there's a dearth of access to fetal brain for, for some of the very early stages, but even for adolescent brain, which you might, uh, want for verification as we start to think about schizophrenia mechanisms. There are not a lot of brain banks with access to young brains or, I mean, do, do, do you have much, if any? I mean, we haven't really explored this in, in much depth. I think we have been relying on just publicly available yeah. data. Um, and, and right now it's mostly almost exclusively from um, adult brain um, at the single cell level. Yeah. Other important aspect is that what's available is mostly transcriptional data sets. And, you know, it's not, it's not all about RNA, obviously. We, there are other cellular phenotypes yeah. that are yeah. important to understand. And I think having these um, additional data sets will be incredibly valuable. Yeah, I think um, a question from Hillary. Yeah, I was wondering if um, uh, with all of these different cell lines and experimental tools and now village in a dish uh, technologies, um, 
for thinking about QTL studies of cellular phenotypes, what kinds of cellular phenotypes might be amenable to QTL studies beyond gene expression? Is this something you guys are thinking about? Absolutely. And maybe I'll add, actually let people um, chime in on this. Maybe I think a lot of people here are. Matt, do you want to take that first aspect about what kind of QTL and then everyone else can chime in? Yeah, um, sort of, you know, we've been working on sort of doing this on a cell morphology based level, whereby using the morphological profiling assays from the Carpenter lab, um, we can link you know, cellular features or signatures of cellular features to particular genetic variants. Um, so any particular, you know, allele may cause one particular feature signature to be slightly different than another. So that's sort of one approach we've been taking, but um, we are moving towards exploring that in a neuron specific cell type. We've currently only done that at a stem cell state, but the, the data so far is promising that we will be able to utilize that in a really meaningful way. That's very exciting. Yeah. Greta, do you want to comment about uh, on protein QTLs? I know you're not really doing that, but starting to think about it. Yeah, that that could be that could be also definitely something that we are interested in exploring, especially because you do see that uh, for some of the in of the interaction that we find in the network, some um, nodes or part of the networks are actually enriched for transcriptional EQTL. So it would be interesting to also overlay this data on whether that impacts the uh, proteome as well. Thanks. Yeah, I can go. Yeah, next. Uh, that we're also looking into. Yeah, we're we're starting our, our village um, or our village projects, and we're really hoping to expand to the point that we can look at, at multiple cell lines and really focus on some key microglia function. And I think, uh, and that's what I've been spending some time where we can like do a lot of these assays in a in a like facts based method, so that we can separate the cells, for example, that would engulf highly versus others that will engulf like at a lower level, and then look into if those cells have any uh, specific genetic mutations that make them susceptible to engulfing more or less. And I think that will be uh, really uh, interesting and hopefully will open us the opportunity to, to look into QTL studies. What kind of sample sizes are you guys thinking about for these uh, QTL studies? I, it sounds to me like you've got access to 800. Is that, uh, are you, yeah, what are you thinking about for sample? So I think there's what cells we can use and what, um, you know, what is actually practical in a given experiment, right? Then you can do everything in batches if you want to scale up. And then the other consideration, which we haven't really discussed, is that, you know, right now we're, we're um, making a bigger push towards having um, these cell, line, cell lines be really accessible, widely accessible. The historic collections are not, so we have to navigate some of these hoops. But typically, I, I would say in most village experiments that have been discussed here are 50 to 100 at once. And then um, similarly, for the um, cell painting assay that we've done just on the stem cell, uh, cell type so far, we have uh, screened 300 in, um, kind of in an array format so far, but I think that it, we could easily um, do 500. When we're talking about differentiated cell types, obviously it's gonna take longer, but Matt is running experiments in batches of 58 right now, and that's that's yeah, reasonable. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on this on scale. We're hoping to get there uh, to those numbers very soon. Uh, we're starting with a smaller pool of 30 at the moment. <laughs> Maybe Hillary, given the diversity of uh, genetic backgrounds, how, how would you even plan the target and how, how should they think about it? Because one of the things that Ralda is doing is thinking about developing our collections, but in the context of what the colleagues in the, in the Stanley Center need for their experiments, as opposed to just adding um, opportunistically which is a great way to start, but not, not where we are now. I think that's super interesting. I think, I mean, one thing that would be nice to ask before even getting into ancestry uh, is effect size. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. And so I think that having some sense of what kind of order of magnitude effect size are we thinking about will be pretty important. Um, and 
then for ancestry, you know, I think that different people have done this differently. Like GTEx uh, includes a lot of people of different continental ancestry in the same study and then corrects with PCs. Um, but I'm, I think that, uh, you know, other folks have taken more careful approaches where you split out by ancestry and then meta analyze at the end of the day, which probably um, does a more thorough job of controlling type one error, I would imagine. On the other hand, I think that with complex traits, uh, you often worry about environmental confounders that maybe you don't have to worry about here. And so I guess I, maybe I don't have as much of a sense for like the, uh, you know, this type of system as opposed to complex traits or like autopsy based um, expression analyses, but it could be that uh, heterogeneity of ancestry would actually be less of a problem <coughs> with C derived systems. Uh, yeah. Having some pilot data in some system would probably be really helpful for planning, you know, um, uh, uh, other other experiments and other systems. Yeah, definitely effect size is one. Um, you know, we could have an idea for rare variants, how many, what, what sample size that we need. And, you know, from specific variants we've studied, you know, a sample size of, um, you know, 40 or 50 would be reasonable for penetrant variants, but for um, subtle effect variants is a different question. Right, right, right. Yeah. The thing to think about with ancestry also is what um, GWAS data are we gonna get? Because, um, you know, if we're trying to use the molecular phenotypes to interpret the GWAS, uh, then it's extra important to match the ancestry because if the variation's not there, you can't see the variation. So I think that with like Pumas and, and uh, all of the other kind of global Stanley Center efforts that'll also motivate uh, diversity in this collection effort. Um, but it is tricky because if, you know, yeah, it's an, uh, that might also kind of increase the total sample size that's needed. Um, and then the other thing that I would just add, I mean, it's kind of an obvious point, the bigger the sample size, the better, but like there's very penetrant variants, but there's also, um, depending on how these uh, behave, if we want to be estimating genetic correlation with uh, you know, with complex traits or doing Mendelian randomization or those kinds of things, um, then having some kind of power for the intermediate and smaller effects would, uh, has the potential to make the difference between being able to tell some things disease relevant and not. Right. And I think we also have, you know, the opportunity to also combine these different genetic backgrounds from different people with um, genetic or pharmacological perturbations that would enable us to study the effect of the same perturbation in different genetic backgrounds. And I think that also can be powerful. It's also powerful to be able to use these different cell types, for example, in assessing the effect of a potential um, target, like a drug target. Is it equally, does it have the same effect or phenotype in different genetic backgrounds? So I think there's a lot of things that we could do without having to scale up to hundreds or, or two thousands of different cell lines. So we can use these tricks that we have. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, this is a question for Francesca that's uh, quite similar to Steve Hyman's. Um, are there functions that you would expect to see in mature astrocytes that you would not expect to see in uh, immature astrocytes? So some functional markers alongside some of the cell surface and protein markers? Yeah, that definitely you can see uh, some markers, but uh, the most, uh, I will say, one of the readout, the readout will be uh, co-culture to see if they support neural growth and maturation. Uh, there are other assays you could do, such as uh, glutamate uptake. Uh, the problem we have, uh, as for the other cells, uh, is that we don't know exactly uh, how human mature astrocyte behave. So we have an idea from mouse study, but it's hard you know, it's at the very beginning. So the most accessible is the transcriptome right now, as Ralda said, but there are a few things you could you could look specifically. I, I don't think we reach uh, uh, maturity as far as um, more than, you know, postnatal with long culture, like six months, nine months culture of astrocyte. There could be a way to assess that, but All right, um, I will call it then. Thank you everyone for joining us so much, um, for joining us. Um, we were, it was a great talk and we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Thank you.